What's up, my wizards? It's DSBMTG. We're looking at magic, and today we got a buttload of corset spoilers to go through yet again. Pretty much every day they release like 300 corset spoilers, so let's go ahead and sort through the chaff and look at the best cards from the day. Now really, sorting through the chaff does not require us to cut that many cards. There's just a bunch of really exciting stuff today. Even if it might not end up seeing too much actual play, there's at least a lot of cool design here. Like Vampire the Dire Moon is something to get hype about. This is just one black mana for a 1-1 vampire with Death Touch and Lifelink. So you kind of... You kind of get a Vampire Nighthawk, uh, but it's got like way lower stats, doesn't have the flying or anything. I just like that a lot of vampires now, like the Death Touch and Life Linked, are, are baked in vampire abilities as well. They should be. That makes plenty of sense in, in terms of flavor. It's a really interesting card that might make its way into a deck or two on just keyword abilities alone. Ferocious Pup is probably one of the cards from today that's like oddly getting the most press because everyone's like, oh, the good boy. <laughs> like, I get that, but outside of Limited, I'm not really sure how great it is. But two bodies in the battlefield is okay, and I don't care what anyone says, one is good for sacrificing. <laughs> It's <laughs> probably the take I've seen most about any card so far today. Is like, don't sacrifice this good boy. No, it's, it's sacrifice him. He's a great sacrifice uh, target. <laughs> but anyway, if there's one good card for wolves over the last few days, like an actual good card that you'll play in a wolf deck, it's Night Pack Ambusher. This is just four mana, two and two green for a four four wolf with flash. And other wolves and werewolves you control get plus one plus one. And at the beginning of your end step, if you didn't cast a spell this turn, you create a two two wolf creature token that's so that's so good like four mana four four is at least a decent rate already they throw the flash on there and that makes it like actually kind of standard playable and if you just happen to have any other wolves around they get plus one plus one so it's an anthem effect kind of a goblin trash master a four mana creature based anthem effect that's cool but even in a non-wolf deck this isn't so bad because if you draw dead for a turn, you just drew a land or whatever on turn 10, <laughs> just late in the game, you just get a wolf. That's really, really good, it turns out. Just a free wolf for doing nothing is really sweet on turns where you kind of have no other option but to do nothing. Or if you just drew a lot of War Elves, you'd probably rather have the wolf in the late game. So I actually think this is maybe decent outside of wolf decks, which makes it really, really good in wolf's decks. But that's not the only four mana green creature today that I want to pay some attention to because we also saw Shifting Ceratops. Dinosaur's getting some love here in this set. It's two and two green for a 5-4 dinosaur that cannot be countered and has protection from blue. And if you pay a green mana, it gains your choice of reach, trample, or haste until end of turn. So this fight's Teferi hard. We've seen a lot of answers to Teferi in this set. You know, Fry we just saw the other day, and that's basically an answer to Teferi. This is the same thing, just for green. Not only does it just swing through blue creatures and stuff, but it's also protected naturally from any of Teferi's abilities, so that's pretty sweet, but it can also gain haste for an extra mana, go ahead and swing into Teferi the turn it comes down. You can even give it trample and, um, and haste at the same time if you have the extra mana for it. Like, a really, really cool card right here. We also saw Spectral Sailor, just one blue mana for a 1-1 Spirit Pirate, a creature type alert, with Flash and Flying. And, it's if you needed more, I guess, you get to pay three and a blue and just draw a card. Modern Spirits probably could have used another one drop, and now they have it, as well as a late game mana sink that allows them to draw cards. That's crazy. That makes this a really good top deck in the later mid game, you know, and usually one drops aren't so i like so much about this card and i think it's probably standard playable too especially when stuff like miss cloak herald or siren storm tamer especially um rotates out this looks really fantastic to kind of take over the slot from cards like that so i've got my eye on spectral sailor i feel like it might have a lot to do in the upcoming format not only in standard but in modern as well another one mana blue card though this one's not a creature it's thick cover and this is T-H-I-C-C-C-C -C 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 cover. This is a good looking card. Just one blue mana for an aura. Enchanted creature. Enchanted creature gets plus zero, plus two, and has tap, draw a card, and discard a card. So, yes to that. Just one blue mana for that is so, so good. And it's going to take a lot of creatures out of bolt range so long as they have two toughness. Um, and pretty much every creature outside of, you know... Uh, moment of craving range or shock range if you can actually get this down and I'm not saying this is going to be like the new curious obsession 
One's Curious Obsession rotates, but like it's going to be the closest thing we have to it. Now, Curious Obsession allows your creature to get bigger and still deal combat damage, and that is very good <laughs> for, for tempo decks. Curious Obsession is kind of the most important piece in those decks, and it's going to suck to lose it. But Thick Cover doesn't quite make up for losing it, but it goes a little bit of the way towards making that deck still real after rotation. I really, really doubt it, but if nothing else, this is a really, really neat aura. Costs the lowest amount of mana that it could... Well, I guess it could cost zero, but not realistically. <laughs> Just one mana for this effect. It's pretty good, and it has the decency to still give the creature a toughness boost, make it a little thicker, if you will. Another cool card today was Agent of Treachery. I'm not sure how much play this ends up seeing. This is a really interesting card. Just seven mana. Just seven mana, right? Five and two blue for a two, three. Seven mana, two, three. So it better be amazing. Human Rogue. And when it enters the battlefield, you gain control of target permanent. That seems good. And at the beginning of your end step, if you control three or more permanents that you don't own, you draw three cards. This is a sweet payoff for Thief decks. And this might go in the Nissa, you know, the Simic Manipulation deck. It just wants to cast the biggest mass manipulation that it possibly can. Grab hold of like three, four things at the same time time and this card goes super well just puts the game way out of reach if it already wasn't that's the thing about mass manipulation is that this card with mass manipulation or in a mass manipulation deck just kind of seems like win more that's my that's my only issue with it is you just play like a one of at the very most you probably already win the game without it but just in case you don't and mass manipulation doesn't put the game out of reach for you then this will draw you three cards every turn so that seems like That'll do the trick. And of course, in a Nissa deck that's looking to, you know, get all the mana in the world anyway, seven mana seems trivial. So, like, this actually could see play for real. But I might as well finish up the blue parade. Jeez, a lot of blue cards here today. With Renowned Weaponsmith, a reprint. From just a few blocks ago, this is two mana, one and a blue for a 1-3 human artificer. You can tap it and add two colorless mana to your mana pool, but you can only spend that mana to cast artifacts or activate abilities of artifacts. But you can also pay a blue and tap it to search your library for a card named Heart Piercer Vow or Vile of Dragonfire. Reveal it, put it in your hand, shuffle your library. We did get those cards today as well, but this is really only like that impactful for the limited environment as far as I'm concerned, or at least the other two cards. Uh, Renowned Weaponsmith might be really sweet <laughs> in standard. There's already artifact base decks, you know, your Sahili and your side decks and all that and this could go really well it's a two drop in those decks i shouldn't have to tell you it can search up cheap artifacts that you cast get Sahili tokens off of or whatever so this could actually see real play too but probably not in a fair deck like the Sahili side deck i'm talking about is mostly fair and this is just a decent card for that but this is probably going to mostly try to go into decks um to break its own like tap for mana ability because obviously a two drop that taps for two mana can ramp you into some really outrageous artifacts. Gilded, Lo Gilded Lotus, Bolus' Citadel if you have the black mana for it. There's a lot of really crazy stuff. You can do God Pharaoh's Statue, Helm of the Host <laughs> right now. So this actually looks pretty cool in a format with a ton of expensive artifacts that are actually really good. The Immortal Sun, like you can keep going <laughs> in the ways that this card might actually see some play if only for the ramp effect. But let's cleanse our palette, wash down that blue, ironically, with a little bit of green aggro. This is Woodland Champion, and I like it. This is two mana, one and a green for a 2-2 elf scout. And whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your control, put that many 1-1 counters on Woodland Champion. That's really <laughs> good in a tokens deck this is fantastic you just cast this on turn two and i don't know sapling migration on the next turn at the very least that seems fantastic look at you you can swing with a four four now <laughs> so on turn three that's really really good and you still have a mana open too um so and that's just the tip of the iceberg like in any edh tokens deck this is a crazy two drop that you immediately slot in but i'm telling you this has standard implications we saw raise the alarm get reprinted but there's also march of the multitudes finale of glory and a bunch of cards in between <laughs> Like, what is it, um, Call to the Feast, the black-white one? So, Abzan tokens, or at the very least, green-white tokens might be a thing again. Things like Thorn Lieutenant and Amara work really well with this. It's just a crazy card that I think has, like, very real implications and can get to a 5-5 very quickly without that much synergy going on. So, I just love this thing. But now let's check out Bloodthirsty Aerialist. A lot of people freaking out about this card, for good reason. Great kitchen table card, if nothing else. This is three mana, one and two black for a two, three vampire rogue. Good creature type, with flying. And whenever you gain life, you put a plus one, plus one counter on Aerialist. 
Yes, this is. I called this Soren's Pride Maid on Twitter last night, and it's pretty good for that reason, but I'm still not sure as much as I want to like this card that it lines up with Standard very well. And I explained this on Twitter too, but just in case you didn't see that, you probably didn't. You, it's like very likely that you didn't. Um, <laughs> but anyway, just in case. Um, this is not too good against like turn three Baby Teferi. That feels really bad. It's not very good against Oath of Kaya either in the same deck, <laughs> you know, so like almost every turn three play that Esper has lines up pretty poorly, um, or pretty well, really, for them um, against this card. And it also can be like Lightning Strike the first turn that you play it, um, and beyond sometimes. You can get hit by Tyrant Scorn at any point in the game, cast down, there's just like, again, it doesn't line up super well with the format. If you get multiple turns with it, then yeah, you can get really big, and I like that about it, but... You also want to be playing, like, in the Black-White Life Gain deck, for instance, you want to be playing Resplendent Angel in this slot, so it's going to be really tough to get, to guarantee either two white or two black on turn three, and really Resplendent Angel is the better card for that deck if you're looking at three drops, and I'm not sure that you can get double white or double black on turn three in that deck, so you might have to choose one, and Resplendent Angel is just the better card for the most part. In black-white vampires, or just mono-black vampires for that matter, with the new Soren, this looks pretty good, but again, it's got all the same problems. It dies not only to removal, but to like all of the really heavily played removal, and I think that might hold it back, and it doesn't do anything the turn it comes into play for the most part. I just, I have real issues with the card, but in a commander, life gain, or kitchen table sense, I think there's an awful lot of good things to be said about the card. Like The card is technically very good. The text is awesome, and it can get huge over the course of the game, but I'm still not entirely sure. Although, again, <laughs> how well it combos with the new Soren and the old Soren, <laughs> the four-mana Soren from War of the Spark, how well it combos with both of those might make this card playable. But now let's check out the best art of the day. This is Drawn from Dreams right here. Four mana, two and two blue for sorcery. Look at the top seven cards of your library. Put two of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. That's fantastic card advantage. A seven card dig. What they basically tried to do here is fix dig through time. Essentially. Um, you don't get a discount on it ever. Uh, but we'll give you some of a discount, right? Like, you don't get to delve, you don't get to make it two mana or anything, but it always costs four, which maybe means the card is playable. Um, that's this is a really tough evaluation, though, because sorcery speed hurts this card so bad. At instant speed, it would have been broken, though. So I really feel for wizards. How, if you want to fix Dig Through Time, how do you price this effect? How, how do you speed this effect? you know, properly. And maybe at like six mana at instant speed, I think I would have liked this card a little bit more, but four mana at sorcery speed, I'm not too sure. You're almost always taking off a turn to play this card, but you are getting the best two cards from the top of your library. And if you're going to combo off and win next turn or completely take control of the game, you know, make sure that you draw your sweeper and a counter spell, um, you know, to use on the next turn, then this is probably a good card, but sorcery speed really, really, really hurts it. But let's check out Edaz Dragon real quick. I'm pretty sure that's how you're supposed to pronounce this. And that sounds really dirty. But we're just going to call it Edaz Dragon or something. It's probably going to translate to something entirely different. So you won't have to worry about it. But anyway, it's five mana, four and a red for a three, three dragon with flying. And when it enters the battlefield, you just create two treasure tokens. You just do that. Um... I've seen a bunch of people have to take like, ooh, I guess treasure tokens are evergreen. Like, yeah, we already knew that. Like, we knew we knew that already. Ziggy like knocking stuff off the table because he's a big bub. He's a fatty. <laughs> just like Papa. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to point this card out briefly because I think it's really cool. And although I'm not sure if it's playable as a 5-mana 3-3 three, three flying, it's kind of a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three flying so long as you already have 5-mana. I like that. It gives you artifacts if you're in an artifact-based deck. It gives you mana if you want that, and you probably do. You can tap on, on the next turn, and you could have as much as, you know, like, eight mana. You know, you had five mana to cast this. You play a land. You got two tokens, so you have access to eight mana, which seems pretty good when you untap the turn after playing this. Plus, it got you a pretty stout body in the meantime. So I think the card might actually be a little bit better than it looks at first glance, and I just want to point it out here because... I found myself playing like Sailor of Means in a bunch of decks for various reasons, so if you're doing that, I can see a world where you'd play this. Now, I brought up Artifacts decks just then a second ago, and a couple of times in this video already, and a good card for those is Manifold Key, kind of a callback to Voltaic Key, 
which is an awesome card to call back to, right? This is just one mana for an artifact. Pay one, tap it, untap another target artifact, or pay three and tap it. Target creature can't be blocked this turn. So, yeah, also kind of like a key to the city in a way. Like, this is really, really good looking and can lead to a bunch of value over the course of a game, especially if you're untapping Gilded Lotuses or Power Stone Shards. Like, good lord, this card could actually be very real and a, if you'll excuse me, key piece to an artifact deck, not only in standard, but in other formats for that matter. But speaking of artifact decks, <laughs> you know, if there's one card that makes that theoretical Sahili side deck even a little bit more real, it's Steel Overseer. And you know what Steel Overseer does. We've needed this reprint for a long time. Just two mana for an artifact creature. It's a 1-1 one -one construct. You can tap it to put a plus one, plus one counter on each artifact creature that you control, including it, which is pretty good, even if you don't have any other artifacts out. But again, in Sahili side, you're going to have all the artifacts. You got Karn out. Karn from Dominaria, you're going to get, you know, <laughs> a bunch of um, counters on your constructs and such. So, yes, to Steel Overseer, not only is this a sweet reprint for Standard that could actually see play in Jank decks, yes, but, like, it could make Jank decks actually playable, so keep that in mind. But it's probably going to see, I mean, it already sees play in Modern, obviously. It's just a great reprint for that format. This card is going for, like, 13 to 15 bucks at the beginning of the day, and this version of it is pre-ordering at about $7.00 or $8 at the most. So that is already a pretty decent price cut for a card that needed that. Now we're not done with sweet artifacts, but we're almost done with cards <laughs> for the day. I've really run through here. We've got Icon of Ancestry next. This is three mana for an artifact. As it enters the battlefield, you choose a creature type. Creatures of the chosen type get plus one, plus one. The translation that we have here does not say creatures you control of the chosen type. So keep that in mind. It's just creatures of the chosen type get plus one, plus one. Pay three and tap. Look at the top three cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card of the chosen type from among them. Put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Commander, staple until forever the end of time. That's a very good card. That's so good, and it might be standard playable. Three mana Anthem effects have been standard playable in the past, and this one gives you card advantage over a long game. This is just a way better Vanquisher's Banner. Like a way better Vanquisher's Banner. And I hated that Vanquisher's Banner was going to rotate in a few months, because like that, that makes any creature type playable. Right? Like, even if it's, I don't know, Wombats. <laughs> you have enough to throw away, in standard at least. Um, I guess you can still play Wombats in EDH with Vanquisher's Banner. But this is going to be another card you play in your EDH creature type that's not a real creature type <laughs> deck. And <laughs> in standard, it keeps doing the same thing Vanquisher's Banner did, just better, for the most part, you know? Yeah, this won't draw you a card every time you play a creature. That's worth the extra two mana on Banner. The mana on Banner... <laughs> But at the same time, this gives you a three-card dig at the end of your opponent's turn or something, just whenever you have the mana for it. Or if you have a buttload of mana in the late game, you draw dead. Well, you can still take your chances and look three through your library with this and try to get a good a creature to cast that turn. So just like everything about this is amazing to me. This is one of the best cards of the day. Easily, not even a hard evaluation. This card's incredible. But let's check out Omnath, Locus of the Royal, because we have to see a three-mana legend like every single day for Commander. This is four mana, one in teamer colors, a green, a blue, and a red for a 3-3 three, three legendary elemental. And when it ETBs, it deals damage to any target equal to the number of elementals that you control, so it's always going to hit for at least one. And whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on target elemental you control. You control eight or more lands. You draw a card, so landfall, put a plus one, plus one counter on it, if nothing else. So that's pretty sweet. And if you have a bunch of lands out in the late game, you just draw cards when you landfall too. So that's crazy. This is standard playable, maybe. Seriously, so long as you play this on like turn five, you know, go ahead, play this for four mana, and then immediately play a land. Yeah, that seems really, really good. You're protecting it and stuff. Like, God, uh, mm, mm. But getting it out of lightning strike range. <laughs> and, and again, it's a legend, so it can't be cast down or anything. It's at mana parity with cards like Vraska's Contempt. Like, I actually think this could be standard playable because it's got an amazing Enter the Battlefield trigger, especially in an elemental deck, I shouldn't have to tell you. Even in just like a Nissa deck where all your lands become elementals. This looks crazy. So, yeah, amazing Enter the Battlefield trigger. Really good in the late game. Gets better as the game goes on gets bigger draws your cards like this card standard playable and might make teamer a thing finally i've been trying to make teamer a thing on arena for weeks now and i've been shuffling around with the deck you know trading out cards trying to figure out what the right build is and this just goes right in especially when rekindling phoenix rotates you're guaranteed you're gonna see this card in a teamer deck for real
But let's look at Cavalier of Night here. Five mana, two and three black for a four five elemental knight with lifelink. And when it ETBs, you may sacrifice another creature. When you do, destroy target creature and opponent controls. When Cavalier of Night dies, return target creature card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So you just get back whatever you sacrificed to Cavalier when it entered the battlefield. Note that you can't use this like a playcraft or you can't just sacrifice it to itself. You know, like a Fleshback Marauder or something. You have to sacrifice another creature if you want this at all. But, plenty of ways to turn that into an upside. Creatures with dies, triggers, and whatnot. Or if you have a Cruel Celebrant out, whatever. And you can use your Sorin or something that you played last turn to get back the creature that you sacrificed. There's so much you can do with this. Lifelink and a 5-mana 4-5. Really, really good stats in the standard. Stops aggro cold. And we've seen a lot of cards that do that. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of aggro and control hate, so this might be the thing that finally shifts the pendulum to mid-range, and I would love that. Like, this set might be the thing <laughs> that swings the pendulum to the direction I've been wanting it to go in for like two years now. So, cards like this in this set, I can't praise enough. But we're rounding the corner here. Just two more cards to talk about today. Here's Elvish Reclaimer. Just one green mana for a 1-2 Elf Warrior. And when it, uh, it, excuse me, it gets plus two, plus two, as long as there are three or more land cards in your graveyard. We'll talk about how easy that is in a second, but you can pay two and tap it and sack a land. To search your library for a land card, put it on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle yo library. This is crazy for one mana. <laughs> Just one mana. They made sure that it survives Goblin Chain Whirler. That's pretty sweet. And it's going to get bigger as the game goes on. It synergizes with itself to get bigger. And the best part about this, it's just a crop rotation on a body. A crop rotation, if you will. And that is really good going and getting any land you want, getting your Nykthos or similar thing in Commander. That's insane. Go get your Gia's Cradle if you're playing Commander. Yes, please. And if you're in Standard, this goes and gets stuff like Blast Zone, Field of Ruin if that's what you want, and a bunch of other lands that you might want to play. Even Cabal Stronghold if you're in Green Black and you're playing enough Swamps. It could actually work if that's what you wanted to do. And there's plenty of ways to put lands into your graveyard, whether you're milling yourself, you're sacrificing things like Blast Zone. There's a ton of ways to do it. Even Evolving Wilds and stuff works pretty well in Standard with this, so I am extremely excited, if you cannot tell, about this card right here. And I think it's going to have a huge impact, not only on Standard, but possibly on on other formats, especially combined with the last card of the day and the thing that I am absolutely the most hype about for the entire set, and it's going to be hard to change my mind because I am a dirty mark, and that is Lotus Field, everybody. This is a land with Hexproof, and it enters the battlefield tapped. And when it does enter the battlefield, you also sacrifice two lands, and you can pay... You can tap it... I'm just so excited. You can tap it and add three mana of any color. You see this? You see this right here? It is always in the background of every single video. It's over here by the uh, in the Calvin and Hobbes book. It's one of my favorite cards of all time. I love Lotus Veil vale so much. And this is effectively a, a Lotus Veil. Vale. Like, not necessarily a better Lotus Veil. Vale. I wish this didn't enter the battlefield tapped or anything. But, but, it's still a Lotus Veil. Vale, and it will almost certainly see play. And note how well it works with the last card we just saw. This puts lands into your graveyard pretty easily. Do it not. Fixes your mana really well. Let's you play Nicole Bolas really easily. Niv Mizzet really easily. Any of these stuff like Goblin Chain Whirler from the last core set. That's a, It's super easy to play all of that <laughs> so long as you have this out. And there are plenty of ways you can get the lands that you sacked back to your hand. It works really well with lots of stuff. We still got Crucible of Worlds in the format for the next three months. Good lord. <laughs> like, I just, I'm super hyped for this again. Like, I'm a rube, you know? Like, I'm a mark for cool magic stuff. I'm a, I'm a mark for callbacks and reprints and stuff. And this just really hits everything on my, like, is this card hype radar? <laughs> you know, nostalgic callback to Black Lotus and Lotus Veil, vale for that matter. Two of my favorite cards of all time. And uh, it actually looks functionally very good. And it looks like there's plenty of ways you can turn this into an upside. But hey, I know what you're thinking. You want to know what to play with this. With some combos, D. Uh... I don't know if you refer to me as D, but all my friends do. So. <laughs> okay, what's some combos, D? Well, this might make Kiora finally playable. How sweet would that be? This octopus lady, I've liked her since the moment she was spoiled, and I knew there was a reason to like her. It's because she goes super well with this. Just don't, just untap this stupid thing. At literally no cost to you. But there's even Blossom Dryad in this format. Something else that untaps lands for three mana. If you want to try that out, it's not. Anywhere near as good, but hey, you know, good old Lay Druid. It's basically the same card. <laughs> it's not so bad once you have 
one of these dumb things out, so I like that. But there's also even, like, Blood Sun, I guess. <laughs> Three mana do-nothing enchantment for most purposes, but if you want a reason to play Blood Sun, this is definitely it. Not only does Blood Sun draw you the card, but it also makes it where you don't have to sack two lands. And it doesn't enter the battlefield tapped. <laughs> so, like, um, again, Blood Sun might finally be a real card one year later. Oh, and by the way, Commander 2, I guess. I, yeah, Commander as well. I'm just, oh, I can't wait to get my hands on this stupid card. <laughs> I really can't. I'm so hyped about this set. Already, there's a lot of like really playable stuff in this core set. It might be one of the best core sets of all time. You know, um, I said yesterday that it's probably the best core set since 4th. And somebody's like, oh, this is better than 4th edition. It's like, I don't know, man. No Winter Orb, Stasis, Black Vice, Ivory Tower, The Rack. <laughs> like I can just name cards all day in 4th edition that I, I want back and are better than probably a lot of these cards. Um, but still, this looks like an intensely powerful set so far. So if you want to pre-order any of this stuff, <laughs> check out the first link in the description. Head over to DCG Player, pre-order any of these singles that we've been talking about, but also get booster boxes for under what would be MSRP if Wizards admitted that MSRP even existed. But anyway, just do all the things. <laughs> Subscribe to the channel for more spoilers because there's going to be more hype garbage coming out in the next week or so here. So stick with us. My exclusive preview on the 24th, that's Monday, mark your calendars, and I suppose I'll catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place, thanks for watching my wizards. Spread love, and be kind.